Hi, I'm Nigel and uh, we're going to be continuing our study guide on Think Right. This is the book on research methodology that I've been using to do these videos to help students to get a sense of not just what this book is about, but hopefully if you don't have access to the book or you do have access to the book and are trying to understand some research concepts, uh, these videos hopefully will help you. Help, help you. Uh, we, are, we are going to focus on what is a thesis today, this, uh, this over here, uh, chapter 9, what is a thesis. But to understand what is a thesis, this book actually explains it a little bit earlier as well. In chapter 5, what is critical thinking over here, uh, what is critical thinking. So just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, explain what is a thesis in relation to these ideas and also in relation to the previous video where I had said what is a problem. I, I know in my book I say problem, methodology and thesis, but the methodology chapter is a bit complex and I want to take time before I develop a video for that. But it's good to see the problem and the thesis together. So the problem is an issue that your paper is trying to address and your thesis is your answer or your solution to that problem. So I'll, I'll just go through that, uh, uh, just some theory about what is a thesis. And I'll also give you some example of how we can look at a thesis in an article or even in your paper. One clarification before we get started. In this book, I use the word thesis in two ways. One, the word thesis is your claim, your assertion, your point of view. And the other is with a capital T, thesis, which is a short form for dissertation. So when I say your MTH thesis, it could, if it's capital, it means your MTH dissertation. So just so that you don't get confused. So the book uses, uses this because we constantly hear it. How's your thesis doing? Have you finished your thesis? We mean the dissertation. But we are, a thesis has a thesis. <laughs> so an MTH thesis, an MTH dissertation, much have a thesis. So that's how I've used it in this book, capital T and small t. Uh, the first place where I discuss what a thesis is, is in page 42 in what is critical thinking. That, that, uh, that's another uh, chapter that requires its own video. But let's just assume that you know what it is or it's not so important to know everything. But uh, page 42, uh, in critical thinking, an important part of critical thinking is making your assertion. Say what you're trying to say. So there are three aspects of assertion. One is have a point of view, have a voice. Now I use this language of voice, which means that when we read a book, there are many voices. Even when you conduct interviews, there are many voices. There are many people that we are reading or there are many people that we are studying or there are many uh, books and articles that have their own perspectives. Now that we have read 15, 20, 30 articles and books, what is your point of view? So assuming this friend of mine, Jayanth, is watching this video. Uh, so Jayanth, what is your voice? Now that you've read this material, what are you trying to say? In view of what are the opinions of others, what is your voice? So having a voice is the first part of making a point. Have a point of view, have an opinion. The second part of having a voice is stating your thesis. This is where you write it. Having a voice is, I, I have an opinion. But stating your voice, stating it is your thesis, where you say, this is my point of view. Yes, I have read my 15 scholars, but this is my view. This is what I, Jayanth, am trying to say. You know, I'm just using Jayanth as an example. But anybody, like, what am I trying to say? So that is stating your thesis clearly, your, your assertion. In this book, I basically say that a thesis is your central claim, your main point that emerges out of your research and is expressed in an academically appropriate manner. So basically, your thesis is your central claim, your, your point, the, the main thing that you are trying to say. However, uh, you can't just say it, you have to defend it. You have to argue that you are right or you are worth listening to. That is your argument, where you not just state your thesis, but you prove your thesis, where you defend your thesis, where you show that your thesis is valid. So there are these three aspects that people look at uh, in terms of critical thinking of assertions, making a point. Now with that said, I think you, you may get a sense of a thesis is an answer to a problem and it should be stated clearly and defended well. Okay, so that you can define a thesis like that. Something that you are saying in your paper that is clearly stated and defended through your paper. Now, now let's go to what is a thesis. And uh, over here in this chapter 9, 
and like we saw in the previous video about the problem, I, I showed that there were four kinds of problems. There was a textual problem, there was a conceptual problem, there was a contextual problem, and there was a positive problem. Now, if you don't understand that, you can go to the, uh, to the previous video. But in view of that, if there is a textual problem, there is a textual thesis. If there is a conceptual problem, there is a conceptual thesis. So that's how I framed it here. What are the various kinds of these theses? Theses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your thesis? And what, what is your particular thesis in relation to your particular problem? So I'll give you an example. So you have the correct, the textual problem, uh, which means that either somebody that you're reading has misrepresented another scholar or he or she has uh, misinterpreted uh, another scholar, uh, has not understood clearly or has not misinterpreted a particular biblical text or misinterpreted uh, some aspect in history. So your thesis would be a correction of that, would either correct the misrepresentation or correct the misinterpretation. That is why we have the first kind of thesis is the corrective thesis. If you can see over here, we are in page 73. The corrective thesis corrects misrepresentation and corrects misinterpretation. Okay, so that's just one example of what a thesis is. This is all in page 73 and 74 over here. Then in view of the conceptual problem, which was the problem where scholars or people come with ideologies that are wrong or misguided, or they use approaches or methods that are wrong or misguided, your thesis in your paper or your thesis in your dissertation will provide an alternative ideology or will provide a better methodology. And so this kind of thesis is called a constructive thesis. Uh, this is in page 74 and 75, where you are trying to develop something better. It's not just correct something. So that's a corrective thesis. You're trying to develop something, a new way. That's a constructive thesis. Then we saw the third problem. A third type of problem was the uh, contextual problem where academia is confused uh, or there are certain issues that are not being addressed. So the contextual problem leads to a contextual thesis where in view of the problem facing academia, you are providing a clarification. You are providing some kind of understanding. So if there's a confusion about definitions, your thesis is a clarification of the correct definition. So this is the contextual thesis that addresses the issues facing either academics or the issues facing society. So that's the contextual thesis. And finally, we have the positive thesis in view of the positively stated problem. <laughs> in the previous video, you would have heard that the positively statement, stated problem is where you take someone's work and you affirm it or you extend it. You, you want to test whether somebody is right and or you want to extend their work to something better. So the positively stated problem leads to the positively stated thesis where you actually say, yes, this scholar is right. My thesis proves it that he or she is correct. In the same way, a positively stated thesis extends another to work where your thesis is, yes, what this scholar said was right. However, how I have built upon that scholar's work is also appropriate, both the, to the scholar as well as my needs in my context. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, all this is very conceptual and, and uh, if, if we can't give you examples of actually over here, uh, it won't make sense. I have given examples in this book, but it may take too long to go through each example well. But let me go to the third part of this uh, video. The first part of the video was just get a sense of a definition of what a thesis is. The second is to show the thesis in relation to the problem. But this third one is, how do you identify a thesis in an article or a book or even in your own writing? So I want to focus on that, the thesis in academic writing. Where, where does it play out? Now, I'm sorry, I'm going to go into flashback <laughs> into another part of this book. I, I'm really sorry. Everything is connected. That's why I believe this whole book is really important. But uh, if you pick and choose, you have to be careful when it draws attention to something in the past. There will, be, there will be footnotes telling you, read here, so you can go back and read what you need. But uh, I can't explain one concept without explaining another. So in writing, in academic writing, 
I talk about thinking and writing. One is you need to be clear about what you think, what, what you're thinking about. And one is you need to be clear what you're writing. And sometimes people just say, oh, your writing is, and they only focus on your writing. But you need to be clear conceptually and you need to be clear verbally in, in terms of how you communicate. So, cons so I have two important aspects in my academic writing chapter, which called about the conceptual structure, which means every ri academic writing needs to have a clear problem or question, a clear problem, a clear methodology, and a clear solution, a clear thesis. So uh, you have a problem, method, and thesis. That's the conceptual. You need to be clear about what you're doing. But in terms of writing, you also need to have a clear written structure. And this means you need to have an introduction, a body of your work, and a conclusion. So when you're communicating the problem method thesis, you need to function within a written structure where you have a introduction, conclusion, uh, introduction, the main body, the main text, and a conclusion. That's the structure of most academic writings. So I use those concepts, and then I see them reflected here. So when I say, how do we look at a thesis in academic writing, I'm looking at both the conceptual structure as well as now the written structure. So I'm, I'm sorry if you're not able to follow, but let's, let's see whether we can do it. So let's now use the written structure, introduction, body, and conclusion. So where is your thesis? Where should your thesis be? So what I say in pages 78 to 80 in, to, in these pages is that uh, there are three aspects to where your thesis will be represented in your work. And that's very important for us to be able to recognize. The thesis is not only in the end. The thesis is, uh, there is a sense of a thesis in the beginning, introduction. There's a sense of a thesis in the middle, the body. And there's a sense of a thesis in the conclusion. So how? So the first part is the introduction anticipates the thesis, uh, where you must give a sense of what your thesis is going to be. You, you may or may not clearly say that this is my thesis. You, some people say it, some people don't say it. Of course, they won't say my thesis is, that they don't use that language, but it's very clear what the author is trying to say or what the author is going to say, sometimes in the introduction. But sometimes it's implied. You can get a sense of what the author is trying to say. So the first part of where a thesis works in an academic writing is in your introduction, where your introduction anticipates your thesis. The second part where we see the thesis in your academic writing is in your body, in the body of your work. This is where you defend your thesis, where you start saying that this is defendable, this is uh, what I am trying to say. Now, uh, I'm sorry, now you're going to go into a list and because of this, the headings over here, it may be helpful for you. But uh, here's the list. So there are three kinds of theses, theses in an academic paper. One is open-ended. You'll see this, uh, and uh, I wish we could do this in a classroom where we could actually put assignments in front of us, articles, and then give you examples and exercises to work through. But an open-ended thesis is where the author reveals the thesis uh, till, till the end. So as you're reading the paper, you don't know what the thesis is, but you have a sense, okay, something, this is what he seems to be saying, this seems to be saying. And then by the end of it, he says, okay, so this is my thesis. I've given examples of this in a later chapter, in chapter 20, you will see how, uh, of how to write a research paper. I've given you examples of how open-ended theses uh, develop, how they, uh, there are scholars who will, won't reveal their thesis in the beginning, but they will, reveal bits and pieces and only in the end we'll find out what the thesis is. It doesn't mean they didn't know what the thesis was in the beginning, but it's revealed slowly. So the middle, the body of your work, is that process where you reveal your thesis. You're, build, you're, building, some, you're building towards a main point. The second type of, type of thesis in academic writing is a soft thesis. Uh, a soft thesis means that it's a tentative thesis. So in your introduction, you'll give a sense that uh, I think this is going to be my view or I'm going to be probably arguing towards this or 
this is towards where where I am going. It's tentative. It's not. It's not like this is correct, and you better believe it. Uh, it's not. It's not. That's that's what we'll see is a hard thesis. But the soft thesis is a, the way the author uh, gently proposes one idea, and then through the body, uh, the author proves that that soft thesis is actually the correct thesis, is actually the right point of view. Okay, so that's the soft thesis. The hard thesis in contrast to the soft thesis, the hard thesis in contrast to the soft thesis is where the author is very clearly trying to prove an agenda, trying to prove their point of view. So in the introduction itself, the author will say, this is my point of view, and the rest of the work proves that point of view. And there are works like that, where, where you see very clearly the thesis in the beginning, the middle proves that thesis, defends that thesis, and in the end restates the thesis. So depending on where you are, you can start with a more tentative position, or you can go towards a more hardline position. That's up to you in academic writing, and all three are appropriate. And, and the final way, the third way a thesis is expressed in your work is in the conclusion, where you either reveal your conclusion, uh, your thesis, or you make your soft thesis, you reaffirm your soft thesis as now a clear stated thesis. This is what I'm trying to say. Or you can say, see, I was trying to prove this thesis in the beginning. I have now proved it. I am now correct. You must now listen to me. <laughs> so that's the hard thesis where uh, you can you can either reveal your work, you can either just clarify what you were trying to say, or you can restate what you were trying to say. And that is the conclusion, where you see a thesis in your conclusion. So in this, in academic writing, your thesis in the introduction anticipates, uh, uh, in the introduction, your thesis is anticipated. In your body, your thesis is developed or defended. And, um, and in your conclusion, your thesis is stated or restated, like you've either, you, you either now reveal this is my thesis, or you restate it. You've said it in the beginning, now you're saying it again. And these are various uh, strategies people use when they're writing, a, uh, when they're using a thesis in their work. Now, just to save you from all this blah, 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 uh, no, no, there's going to be more blah, 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 sorry, I, is I'm going to use an example. And I'm going to use an example from this book, uh, 500 Years of the Reformation. It's a book edited by Roji, Thomas George, and Nigel Ajay Kumar. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, my friend Roji from SIAX, and, uh, and I, we were, when, we, when I was working in SIAX, I was, uh, uh, we were editing this book. And this, it was based on a conference that we went to. And, um, and in that conference, the conference title was 500 Years of the Reformation. And we had invited various scholars to write papers. And we compiled those papers, edited those papers, compiled them, and then we printed it in, in this book. Like this, there are several other consultation books at SIAX. Now, and I'm going to take one example from this book in page 65 uh, by a scholar called Samuel George. Now, Samuel George is a friend, so I hope he doesn't mind me using his work as an example. I'm not being critical or anything. I'm not trying to review his work, but I'm trying to show his work as, a, uh, as an example of, of what I've just said about how a thesis works. So we're going to look at his article in brief. I mean, I, I, I wish you had the article in front of you. I'll put the text over here, a little bit of the text. I can't freely give you the text uh, access to it. But this is page 65. Maybe Google Books will allow you to access this, uh, the, this page. But what you will see is that Samuel writes uh, Sola Scriptura even after 500 years and Christian theology and the authority of scripture. So very clearly from there, we are seeing that the article is about Sola Scriptura, which is a, a Latin word to saying only scripture. Uh, and it was something that uh, uh, was a cry in the Reformation. And Samuel is looking at this cry sola scriptura and seeing how it is relevant for us today, even after 500 years. And so he has a section called introduction, uh, right over here. Now, what I've been saying is that the thesis works in the introduction where you either, where you anticipate your thesis, where you state your problem, you state your methodology, and you'll also anticipate your thesis. Now, over here, so uh, I won't read the whole thing out loud. But you'll get a sense of what I'm trying to say. Uh, so, so in the first part, he's basically saying, okay, sola scriptura was an important part of the Reformation. 
And then after that, he says, but can we say the same after 500 years of the Bible being liberated from the authority of the church, from the authority of uh, the Roman Catholic Church? The Bible was liberated from it. Has it been? Has it truly been liberated? And is it a liberative text? Uh, today, people both inside and outside the church equate the idea of the authority of the Bible with coercion and even terror rather than liberty. The authority of the Bible has been invoked to suppress free inquiry and to legitimize such practices such as slavery and patriarchy. For many, it has become the text of terror. In such a context, the question of the authority of scripture is to be relooked. What better time to remind ourselves about the scripture and its relevance for Indian Christianity than the quintessential of the Reformation? So here we are seeing the problem. The problem is that the reform reformers wanted to liberate the Bible from the control of the church and give it to the people uh, freely, the free access of scripture. But has the Bible truly been free, a uh, freeing? And Instead, we see in history, no, it hasn't. It has been used to support slavery. It has been used to suppress women. So rather than being a text of freedom, it has become a text of slavery. So that's one problem uh, that Samuel is referring to, where uh, this is a contextual problem, where uh, the problem in our society, the problem in our churches, the problem in our academics, the Bible has not been freed. In fact, it has been used to enslave. So that's one problem that Samuel is identifying. And, and then he says, so it is the reformers who gave the clarion call back to the Bible. Even after 500 years, the Bible continues to be the fundamental foundational source of theologizing. The premise of this paper is that the authority of scripture is relational to hermeneutical principles. Now here is where his methodology is being uh, proposed, where he's going to say, we need to do hermeneutics. We need to do uh, interpretation, a certain way of interpreting scripture to, uh, to, to understand the scripture and its freedom. So that's his approach. And then here is the thesis. This paper is an attempt to understand and propose a few principles of interpretation that are essential for theologizing in the Indian context. So the problem is the text and freedom. Uh, the method is reinterpretation. And this paper will propose certain ways of interpreting scripture. So that's anticipating the thesis. So already you can get a sense. Okay, Samuel is going to anticipate, is going to present a way of looking at scripture. And that's his answer to the problem. Have we interpreted the text correctly? Have we interpreted the Bible uh, authority correctly? Have we done that correctly? Okay, so that's where a thesis works in an introduction. Okay, so now that we, we've seen the introduction, we now move to the body of the work where Samuel has two parts. One is the Bible and the Reformation, where he looks at the history and then he has another section called Sola Scriptura and Christian Tradition, where he talks about the principles of interpreting scripture. Now, in the first part, the Bible and Reformation, Samuel uh, looks at how the problem was the issue of authority of the church over the scripture. And that was the main problem that why people said and why people like Martin Luther said Sola Scriptura. He was not talking about individualism, that everybody individually looks at scripture, but he was saying the church cannot control the interpretation of scripture. So he was trying to free scripture from the control of the church, not trying to say everybody create your own meaning. That is not what Luther was trying to say. So you must understand sola scriptura in its historical context. So that's what the first part is. And then the second part is, so therefore, how should we interpret scripture? Now that it is sola scriptura is a contextual thing, uh, the principles of interpreting scripture are we must look at the scripture contextually like in the sorry historically see in its in its own context then we must interpret scripture theologically which means that we must look at scripture in view of what god is trying to say third uh, scripture should be interpreted ecumenically which means very clearly here that you should not do it individually that you yourself are the meaning but take the wisdom of the church listen to other people in the church it's not giving authority that, oh, because my pastor says that is why it's true. It's, that's not what we're talking about. We're saying listen to other people, work together. 
uh, be ecumenical, which means work as a church in trying to interpret scripture. Don't just you come up with a meaning and don't test it with somebody else. We must work together and learn from other interpretations as well. Don't think you are right and everybody else is wrong. So that is the next interpretation. And then finally, he offers uh, the scripture should be context, uh, so not finally, two more points. Scripture should be interpreted contextually, means the issues that are facing today. See how scripture relates to those. And scripture should be interpreted liberationally, uh, where uh, in view of God's concern that God cares for the poor, God cares for the liberation of the poor, the scripture should be written with that uh, focus. And he ends that section by saying, there are a few characteristic marks of liberation hermeneutics. One, it is a hermeneutics that favors application rather than explanation. And two, it raises the Bible as a book of life, not as a book of strange stories. Uh, three, it seeks to discover and activate the transforming energy of biblical texts. And four, the theological political reading of the Bible stresses the social context of the message. Now, uh, please don't get thrown off by this. I'm not trying to promote this or trying to critique it or trying to say that it's wrong or right. I'm just trying to say that here you already start seeing Samuel's point, what he's trying to say, that the scripture must be freed from the control of the church, but it does not mean that the scripture is free to be interpreted by anyone anywhere. We must allow the scripture to be read through certain rules. And these are the rules that help us to understand how scripture has authority over us. So that's what he's trying to say. So the thesis is developed through his argument over here. And finally, at the end, the conclusion, uh, he, oh, what is said over here, as noted in this essay, scripture continues to be the fundamental authority in our theological thinking. But as ex explained, for such authority to be meaningful and relevant, it needs to be interpreted in the given context. So that's his thesis again. His first thesis anticipated, his thesis developed in the body, and his thesis stated more clearly in the conclusion. So that's how a thesis works. Now, when, uh, when you're looking at an article, uh, you can actually see the thesis of the author uh, anticipated, developed, and stated. And that's really helpful. The same thing you must ask yourself in your writing. How is your writing? Are you clear about your thesis in the beginning? Are you arguing for your thesis in the middle? And have you stated your thesis clearly at the end? So going back to this book, so we were basically going through chapter nine and this idea comes from, from that over here. I, I'm sorry, I've not given more examples. I wish I could do more examples here from like books and articles. But for now, I hope that will give you a sense of what I'm trying to say in this chapter. There's more practical statements of how to write a research paper later on, uh, which apply these rules in, in your writing. So that's why the, this, this chapter seven comes from the early part where you try to understand a thesis and then you have to practically write it in your work. So anyway, I hope you found this useful. I'm sorry this video went too long. Uh, I promise you that the text is a little bit more clearer because it has more examples. And uh, so I hope that you'll find the text useful. But if not, I hope these lectures themselves provide you some kind of uh, uh, guidance towards what is in here for you to see whether it's useful for you or not. Uh, okay, so with that said, uh, bye till I see you in the next video.